I'm so glad so many of you are here. I love to share my love for the Arthurian legends with anybody I can talk to. The other night at dinner, I mentioned that I was doing this. I was out with some friends. And the first question asked of me was, I heard rumors that Arthur was real. Is that true? Well, we'll address some of that today. Um, she told you of some of the things that helped create my interest in, in the legends. Uh, but I think my first memory of being connected to them, I was 17 years old, very idealistic. I was a freshman in college, and JFK was assassinated. And they kept mentioning phrases like, that one shining moment on the hill, the end of Camelot. And I really, at 17, all I cared about was boys. Uh, so I really didn't know what they were talking about. I just knew how I felt at the time. Um, and so I started reading. And one of my favorite books, many of you may have read it, is The Mists of Avalon. Again, a fictional story, but it's from a woman's perspective, which is very different uh, than reading, say, Sir Thomas Mallory, who wrote the uh, La Morte d'Arthur. Um, I also taught some stories as a junior high teacher, uh, like Sir, uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, I saw art that just spoke to me. Uh, things by Dory, things by the pre-Raphaelites, like uh, probably the picture you're most, the painting you're most familiar with is the lady on a barge floating down a river. Um, do you know who she was and her relationship to the story? Well, I'm going to tell you <laughs> later. Um, but the art, the poetry of Tennyson in his Idols of the King spoke to me. Uh, and then I was honored enough to get uh, a grant from the National Endowment of the Humanities to study the King Arthur legends, to read Sir Thomas Mallory's volumes, and I mean volumes in Middle English, of the Arthurian legends. Um, it was probably the best summer I ever had to, to be so immersed in one subject with 15 other like-minded people uh, and to be able to, to go into the library at Yale and do research. It was just, it was fabulous. Um, and I have a tendency to like programs on TV and movies that also speak to me as if they were part of the legends. How many of you w have ever watched Game of Thrones? Okay, there's several hands raised. Uh, Wonder Woman? Okay. <laughs> um, the Avengers, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, all of those. They are all connected. Tolkien, who wrote The Hobbit, stopped write, rewriting the Arthurian legends because he got on the kick to write The Hobbit. And he never finished rewriting the Arthurian legends. Um, the pervasiveness of the Arthurian legends is with us today. It's, it's everywhere, uh, especially in these times. And I'm going to try not to be political, but the story of Arthur is the story of one man who tried to make the world better. Um, and the universality of the human struggle to be the best we can is all part of this story. Um, and through this story, we can see how we as individuals can can make a difference, uh, whether it's to our next door neighbor or in the political arena or whatever arena we work in, that we can make a difference. Um, we saw it in this last month 
when we said our final goodbyes to John McCain. He was a human being. He had flaws. But to many, he was a hero. Why was he a hero? Any of you have an idea why he was a hero? Well, he stood up for his principles. Exactly. He stood up for his principles. Even yesterday, in yesterday's paper, how many of you read The Courier yesterday? A couple of you. Okay. Uh, there was a column by Peter Funt, and he was writing about uh, two people, primarily Jimmy Carter, and the other one was McCain. And he wrote, I was reminded of how two genuine heroes, McCain and Carter, so starkly opposed in political views, could yet could set a uniform example of how to conduct our lives and our government. They had a purpose and they stuck to their principles. King Arthur was a hero in the legends. To me, he was a man with human failings who tried to make his world better. Um, now, the, again, I, the main question I get, was Arthur real? Was all the, uh, are all these legends based on fact? Are they just from some writer's head? Well, they, today many scholars um, believe that Arthur, there was a real Arthur. He didn't live during the Middle Ages and there were no knights in shining armor. But after the fall of the Roman Empire, it left a vacuum in the area we now know as England and Scotland. And, and everybody started warring with each other. Uh, neighbor would beat on neighbor. Uh, tribes would go against other tribes. Uh, but there was a warlord, and his name was Arturus. He was. He was the descendant of uh, a Roman gentleman who had come to this part of the world and a natural uh, woman of, who lived in, in the area. And his name was Arturus, but he was, a, he was a warlord. He was violent, he was savage, but what he did was to take the various tribes in his area and band them together to fight those who were invading from everywhere else. That, the area of England was ripe for the picking. Um, and the Jutes and the Angles and the Saxons and the Picts and the Frisians, they were coming over by sea and they were invading, trying to take over. And he got the tribes to come together instead of warring with each other and defeat them. Um, so there really was an Arthur. He's just not the Arthur that we see in the legends. Um, this happened around 500 AD. And to give you a, a perspective, the story of Arthur by Mallory, the primary story, wasn't written for another thousand years. So how did all those later writers get information? It was the Dark Ages, everything was ill. There weren't books, there wasn't publishing, there, was, there just wasn't, it just wasn't there. And so stories were told by the Vards, uh, by fathers to sons. Uh, they were just stories. How many of you have ever played the game telephone in your life? <laughs> what happens at the end after it goes through, say, just 10 people? It's a little twisted. It's a little twisted. And you're all right there in the same time frame. Uh, so it. Because it was transmitted orally, um, things got a little twisted. Uh, 
600 years passed, uh, so things were a little different. But there was, as, as scholars are, are still working on proving, there was a warlord that this all may have been based on. And his name was Arturus, of course, which figures into Arthur. Um, Welsh, le Welsh legends also give us information about this warlord. Uh, and they're fascinating because um, they were written, well, they weren't written, but they were, they were spoken of um, after Arturus lived. Uh, The first written account of Arthur was written by Geoffrey of Monmouth in his Historia Regum Britannia in 1136, over 600 years after the real Arturus. In 1165, it starts to get interesting because the French writer, uh, Chrétien de Troyes, uh, he begins to introduce a few other elements that weren't in the original stories. He introduces Lancelot, the most perfect knight, and later he introduces the idea of the Holy Grail. And this is where we begin to see the contributions of the church to the whole Arthurian legends. Uh, in 1190, they exhumed the bodies, what they thought were the bodies, of Arthur and Guinevere at Glastonbury and identify the site as Avalon. Is it true? Is it not true? Were those really the bodies? Were they not the bodies? We don't know. Monks were trying to make a living, to make money. And if they could say, well, this is Arthur's grave and this is Guinevere's grave, guess what? Everybody wanted to come to, to see the grave sites. Um, so again, we're in that, it's almost like the whole story of Arthur is in, engulfed in this mist of Avalon, uh, trying to figure out what's real and what isn't. In 1200, Robert de Baron uh, mentions the grail as used by Christ at the Last Supper. Again, the influence of the church. In 1330, the round table was made, the one that's in Westminster. In 1830, I mean, in 1380, I'm sorry, I'm dyslexic, uh, the phrase, the once and future king, was first used in the alliterative Arthur. And then in 1470, Sir Thomas Mallory finishes his volumes called Le Mort de Arthur, the death of Arthur. By the way, he was in jail at the time while he was writing all this stuff. Guess he had plenty of time. Um, he was in jail for breaking the code of chivalry. Um, he translated all the stories. He combines all available sources uh, into one telling of the Arthurian legends. And it's long. It's over a thousand pages. Um, that's what I studied when I went uh, on the National Endowment of the Humanities Grant. From 500 to 1470, a span of nearly a thousand years, what started with the story of a single warlord 
And the actions of this warlord became what we now know as the legends of Arthur. Um, for 1,600 years, these stories have gained our attention. Uh, we have fallen in and out of love with different characters, uh, but they have held steady. Um, what is it about them that makes them uh, evolve? And it seems like every well-known author wants to rewrite some of it. I just finished reading The Return of Merlin by Deepak Chopra. Uh, I mean, everybody wanted to get, a, I think everybody wants to do it and wants to do it right and do the bestseller of King Arthur. Um, we're going to talk in my class, when I, when I do this through Ollie, I facilitate a class through Ollie on the Arthurian legends, and I use a lot of the uh, great courses uh, videos because there are several uh, professors who speak on this with such authority and such knowledge, they're just wonderful. And what I'm doing here is condensing what I had to condense into six classes into one. Um, but some of the basic ele elements of these stories are, number one, uh, chivalry. What is chivalry? Anybody have any idea what chivalry is? Yep. And you can get on the internet and you can buy plaques with the code of conduct. You can buy all kinds of things with codes of conduct. But the one thing they don't tell you is that these were written by the knights and Arthur not to go from the top down, but these, this was a code of conduct written by the knights on how they should behave to set an example. Okay, picture yourself in today's world. The equivalent of King Arthur and all his knights, I would say would be um, the President, Congress, and the Cabinet. You're a member. I want you to talk to the person next to you for just a minute. And what would be the first rule you would make for how your Congress, how your cabinet, and how your executive would, should behave as an example to people? Take one minute and talk to your neighbor. Come up with one rule that you would make for this code of conduct. And you can make it according to today's world. <laughs> Some of you are laughing. This is serious. You're making rules for yourself on how you're going to live. <laughs> okay. Anybody come up with a rule? Come on. Respect for each other. Respect for each other. That's what you guys had too? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. My rule was that I was on a trench. Oh, that you were always right. Oh, so you're King Arthur, huh? <laughs> Except Arthur didn't do that. <coughs> Arthur was not always right. Um, Arthur was a human, well, Arturus. Uh, but in the story, Arthur is still a human man uh, who makes mistakes. So, chivalry is simply a code of conduct that they wrote for themselves so that they would behave in a manner that the rest of the population could emulate. It's very simple. One of the other elements that we talk about in, um, in my class is the element of magic. What comes to mind, or who comes to mind when I say the element of magic? Merlin. Merlin. Um, 
And do you think of M Merlin as kind of looking a little Gandalf-like? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, there was a series called, I think it was called Arthur, or the, yeah, I think it was called Arthur, or the Legends of Arthur. Uh, on one of those, you know, expensive stations you had to uh, pay for extra. Um, and they did an absolutely wonderful job, but it only lasted for a year. Uh, but they had Ray Fiennes play Merlin, and he looked like a regular person, as good as he looks. Um, and he wasn't this wizardy kind of, of uh, person. Merlin was a magician. He was a prophet. He could see the future. He was Arthur's political advisor. Um, and he is also credited with building Stonehenge. Huh. Everything that you read about any of these characters, you're going to find 15 different versions. <coughs> was he real? Was Merlin real? Was he based on somebody that was real? Uh, there are sources that say that there was a uh, 8th century uh, Welch bard who turned into a mad hermit, uh, and his name was Midrin. Uh, so maybe some of the Merlin stories are based in that. There was also a Scottish, Scottish bard, Lailokan. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I forgot. Um, that the, the current Merlin might be based on. Um, so the, this whole idea of magic was... Uh, used throughout the story. And I think it was used to help explain things that were unexplainable. Um, even at the beginning of the story of Arthur, his birth deals with trickery and magic. Does anybody know that story? There was a beautiful queen named Igraine. She, was, oh, she wasn't a queen, she was a lady, I guess. And she was married to the Duke of Cornwall. Well, Uther Pendragon fell in love with her, and he wanted to bed her. And so he used Merlin to help him. And they tricked her into believing that Uther was her husband, the Duke of Cornwall. So she bed him, and she became pregnant with Arthur. So even his birth involves <coughs> magic. They do this a lot in, in, in the Arthurian legends, the trickery and the bedding and who comes out of these, these trysts. Um, Arthur was a teacher. He taught Arthur as he was a youngster. He took Arthur away from his mother, Igraine, um, and put him in a house where he would learn how to be a good person, really. Uh, he had no idea he, he was descended from royalty. Um, Merlin could talk to the animals, and you see that in some of the movies you've seen. Um, no one was not the only mag magician. How did Arthur get his sword? Lady of the Lake. Lady of the Lake, yes. And it wasn't the sword that protected him, it was uh, the sheath that it was in. That's what protected him. If he had the sheath on him, then he was protected. You could stab him and he would heal. Um, the Lady of the Lake was Vivian. She's the one that helped raise Lancelot. Um, the conception of 
Galahad. How did that happen? That's where we get to Lancelot and his two Elaines. He had two, two women who worshipped him, loved him, adored him. The first Elaine wanted to, to marry him and she used trickery to get him. She used trickery in that she pretended to be Guinevere. And Lancelot was in love with Guinevere. So he thought he was with Guinevere. And Elaine becomes pregnant with Galahad. It's amazing how all the heroes in this story uh, are conceived in trickery. Um, who, do you know who Modred is? Modred? He's Arthur's son. He's Arthur's son. But who is his mother? Morgan. That's, huh? Morgan Le Fay. Yeah, or Morgaus, or that's another thing that changes throughout the legends. Uh, <clears throat> they they do a pretty good job of at least keeping the first initial, but they change the names. Uh, but Morgan Le Fay was his sister, and yeah, she tricked him. She tricked Arthur when he was young, and Mordred was the result of that. Um. There's a lot of trickery. And there's trickery of those who commit trickery. Anybody know what happens to Merlin? Some woman lures him into a cave and puts him to sleep or something. Good. Um, he falls in love and he knows. He knows this is going to happen. He, he can see his future. He knows that if he falls for this woman and if he lives with this woman, that she will be the death of him. And the story goes that even knowing this, he still gets involved with her. It was Vivian, the Lady of the Lake. Um, and the story goes that even knowing this, he falls in love with her and she either entraps him under a rock or in a cave or in a tree. Um, there is a beautiful piece of artwork where he is sitting beneath a great oak tree with her and she is looking up at him adoringly, he with the white beard and the robes and and he knows she's going to be the end of him, but he still can't resist. Um, so there's just so many elements of, of magic. The whole idea of the sword and the stone, all of that is, is things that can't be explained any other way. So magic sounds good to me. Um, but the magic and the tricking help explain the unexplainable. Another element of these stories is romance. And that definitely came from a lot of the uh, French writers, especially Cretien de Troyes. Um, first we have the major romance between three people. Arthur, Lancelot, Guinevere. Arthur and Guinevere our husband and wife, they love each other. And then Lancelot comes along. And he is so loyal to Arthur. He loves Arthur, not in a romantic way, but and Arthur loves Lancelot because he is his best knight. Um, but according to courtly love, the rules of courtly love, it's okay for Lancelot to be in love with Guinevere. And here again we see the church enter the picture where it becomes sinful for Lancelot to bed Guinevere. 
Um, courtly love, it was okay. Anybody have any idea why Arthur did not do something about it a long time ago when he first knew, and he knew, that Lancelot and Guinevere were an adulterous affair. Why didn't he do anything? <laughs> Can anybody make a guess? Because he loved them both, and he wanted to see them both happy, and he didn't feel it diminished him. And remember, it was OK according to the rules of courtly love. But here was a man who loved so well that he didn't want to hurt anybody that he loved. So romances are a big part of the story. That's probably the part I got started on first. Um, Lancelot, and this is what Thomas Mallory writes about Lancelot. Ah, Lancelot, you were the finest of all Christian knights. None on earth could match your strength. You were the most loyal friend to your love who ever sat on a horse. And you were the kindest man who ever struck with sword. And you were the most courteous man who ever walked among a throng of knights. And you were the most meek and gentle who ever feasted with the ladies in the hall. And you were the sternest knight to your mortal foe who ever couched spear in the rest. What is he primarily praising Lancelot for? For being a hero. Well, for being, for being kind, for being loyal, for uh, being meek and gentle when you, when you talk to the ladies. But at the final in the final sentence, uh, you were the sternest knight to your mortal foe. You were, you were strong. And to top it off, Lancelot was extremely handsome. That's why all the actors wanted the role of Lancelot in the movies. Uh, he was handsome. All the ladies loved him, not just Guinevere. Um, but there was another Elaine that loved him too, besides the one that he conceived Galahad with. Does anybody know who she is? Her name was Elaine. I have no idea why whoever put all this together had Lancelot with two Elaines. One he conceived Galahad with, the other Elaine died of unrequited love. Do you know the, the painting that shows her dying of this unrequited love? You've probably seen it a million times. It's the Lady of Shalott. The lady, uh, she's on a barge and she's beautiful. She's got her hair, hair is streaming and she looks so peaceful and she's dying of unrequited love. Um, so, I'm not sure where the two Elaines come from, but there were two. Um, another big element of the Arthurian legends is the Grail quest. And when I was young, I said, what's a Grail? I didn't have any clue what a Grail was. And the grail in these stories morphs. It morphs from a dish that uh, produces food uh, to the cup that Jesus Christ drank from at the Last Supper to the vessel that caught Christ's blood while he was being crucified. Um, Picture this, 150 knights and Arthur are sitting around the round table. And if you've ever seen the round table, it doesn't hold 150 knights. Um, but they're sitting around the 
roundtable. There is a seat called the, the Siege Perilous, and that was a seat no one could sit in except for the one per person who could actually find the Holy Grail. Um, and they're all sitting around, and all of a sudden a vision appears. And the lights are beaming, and there's a sweet aroma in the air, and all of a sudden, we, all the knights see this vision of the grail. Um, and they decide to go on a quest. And they search all over England to find the grail and face many dangers. Lancelot, the head knight, you'd think he'd be the one to go get it. But he went on the quest, but he couldn't be the one to find it. Why? You need a pure heart. Uh, it's a little more than that. His heart was good. He needed a pure body, too. Uh, because of his affair with Guinevere, Guinevere, he wasn't pure. There were three knights who were closer to being pure. Bors, Galahad, and Percival. And they go together to the castle Corbonic in the Wasteland. Does that strike a note with any of you, the Wasteland? T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland? Uh, the illusions are all over the place. I'm not even getting to the, the illusions. But if they go to the castle Corbonic. Uh, one of the rulers there is King Pellas. He has a wound that won't heal. It just won't heal. And he's miserable. It won't kill him, and it won't heal. So they go to his castle. He, uh, king Pellas is also referred to as the Fisher King. And at this castle, they see a vision. And in this vision, Joseph of Arimathea appears as a priest. Angels bring in the grail. And, the, and Longinus' bloody spear, the spear that pierced, uh, pierced Jesus Christ's side during the, the crucifixion. They see all this, and all of a sudden a child appears above the grail and changes into bread. Jesus Christ emerges from the cup and gives communion to the three knights. And this vision is said to be proof that the bread and wine of the Mass are the body and blood of Christ. Now you see a complete molding of the Christian doctrine and the Arthurian legends. It's almost as if the Arthurian legends are used to promote the church. Um, Galahad uses the blood from the spear that appears to heal Pellas' wound. The three knights then leave the castle and go aboard a ship that is carrying the grail. And the ship carries them almost supernaturally to Ceres. And I'm sure there's a reason it went there, but I, I didn't have time to look it up. Uh, at that time, when they get to Ceres, Galahad is born to heaven. The angels come and take him to heaven. And this is seen by Bors and Percival. And also the grail is taken to heaven. And we never hear from Galahad again. Um, 
So this is the story of the Holy Grail, the quest for something worthwhile. Um, this is a lesson in life to everybody. Quest, work, do whatever you do, but do it for a noble purpose. The last element, and probably one of the most meaningful elements of this story is Arthur's death. Arthur tries to create this perfect place where everyone is treated well um, and people have respect for one another and take care of one another. And we called it Camelot. Um, and it ends when Mordred, Arthur's son, finds Lancelot in Guinevere's chamber and condemns Guinevere to burning at the stake. Of course, Lancelot shows up and rescues her as she is placed on the pyre. Um, and in the process of rescuing her, he inadvertently kills two knights, one of which is Gwen's brother. Um, Gwen is furious, and Camelot erupts into a civil war. Um, Lancelot and his allies go to Lancelot's castle, Joyous Guard. The Pope finally banishes Lancelot to France. Gwen's lust for revenge uh, gives King Arthur no choice but to follow Gwen to France. There, Gwen and Lancelot duel for hours. Gwen is wounded and the duel ends. And nobody's happy the duel ends. Lancelot refuses to kill Gwen. which he would normally be expected to do, but he just can't do it. Um, while Arthur and Gwen and Lancelot are all in France, Mordred usurps the crown and he takes Guinevere. So Arthur comes back. campaigns against Mordred, and during this battle, Gwen dies of the wounds he suffered from Lancelot. In his last breath, he voices his regret over his need for revenge. The armies of Arthur and Mordred fight to the death, literally, of all but one knight. So all the knights are now gone. The only knight left standing is Bedivere. And Bedivere, Sir Bedivere, witnesses the final duel between Arthur and Mordred. And I'm sure you've probably seen artwork that, that depicts this battle. Arthur pushes a spear into Mordred, goes all the way through him. Mordred takes his sword and cleaves the top of Arthur's helmet. Mordred is dead. Arthur is wounded 
Bedivere attends to him. And then does anybody know what happens? That's the good part. That's where it all sort of begins again. I'm just going to read this to you. Um, In the twilight, a great swan-like black barge appeared upon the water bearing nine noble ladies all hooded in black. Among their number were three queens, Morgan Le Fay, the Queen of North Gales, and the Queen of the Wastelands. And of the others, one was the king's guardian, the Lady of the Lake. With their healing hands, these nine fair women lifted the wounded king up from the battleground and took him to their barge to be carried far across the waters. Some say they ferried the king only to his grave. But in truth, the nine sailed through the mist to the distant isle of Avalon. Arthur came to Avalon to heal his mortal wounds and to find a place where his tortured soul might rest. The greatest of the queens, Morgan Le Fay, who was also fate, took Arthur to her chamber and placed him upon a golden bed. For though Morgan and Arthur were rivals in the world of mortals, in Avalon, Morgan Morgan became the instrument of his salvation. She uncovered and bathed Arthur's terrible gaping wounds. Then she used soothing ointments and whispered a healing spell as she bound them with, wi- with linen. Gently, she spoke to the king, saying it was within her powers to heal him, but his body and health would be restored only if he would remain in Avalon. And so it is rumored among the Britons since Arthur's passing that, with Morgan at his side, He remains in that earthly paradise where no harsh harsh wind blows. In that fairy kingdom, King Arthur holds court as once he did in Camelot. There all the heroes of the world gather and feast and have tournaments and all manner of sport and play. King Arthur waits in Avalon and watches the world. He watches the Britons and all the other folks of his realm. There, he waits for the time of their greatest need when he will come among them again. Um, and this is, this, come, this is the fruition of the once and future king. And during World War II, uh, many believed that Churchill was Arthur again that he waited for a time when the Britons sorely needed him and he came back and, and uh, did what was necessary to do. So whatever, um, whatever you believe, uh, if you go to see the tomb at Glastonbury, on, on the tomb you will see, here lies Arthur, the king that was, and the king that shall be. What is real, what isn't, the more you read, the less sure you are of anything. According to Deepak Chopra in in The Return of Merlin, time is not linear. So, the battle between Arthur and Mordred is still going on. And within each of us, is our own Merlin that can affect the battle. We can make things happen. Um, It's a story with a lot of power, a lot of supernatural, a lot of human qualities. Uh, So whenever you get a chance, read a book. There's even a comic book series (laughs) set in space in the future (laughs) where Arthur is around. I think there's like 12 comics. I have not been able to find them. I think they're pretty rare. Uh, But um, keep reading and keep thinking about the world today. And do we long to go back to a time when there was respect and honor and loyalty and love and peace? 
Um, and how do we get there? So thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. You have a question? Yeah. The, the current queen of England and the king, are they supposed to be descendants from Arthur? Um, the royal blood, is that where that comes from? No, I don't think so. I think it, it it's, I'm not a history buff, so uh, I think it comes from somewhere else. All right, I wasn't uh, sure. Because Arthur, the first Arcturus, was just a warlord. He was just a guy. Okay, two questions. One, and I've long wondered this, why in the area of 4 to 500 AD there seems to be no written history in England? Certainly the Romans that ruled England before that had good written history in Italy and the Greeks. You go to England and there are all sorts of castles, abbeys, ancient ruins they know nothing about. Mm -hmm. There seems to be no written history. No, nothing's written down. And scholars are, are searching. I mean, they're working on their doctorals, trying to find more information. It could be somewhere, but they haven't found it yet. The second question I have is, uh, I went to uh, Tintagel mm -hmm. in Cornwall. It is a spectacular ruin on the Cornwall coast that is rumored to be King Arthur's castle. Mm -hmm. Boy, it's a spectacular And underneath, there's a giant sea cave called Merlin's Cave. And it, it's just, I mean, obviously, it's just another legend, but nobody knows. But there's, there's a seed to every legend. There's a seed of truth somewhere in every legend. Um, it's just, I kind of like it the way it is, where I don't know for sure. Otherwise, it becomes way too... Um, Mathematical. Um, I like the idea of of there being someone out there who will take charge eventually. <laughs> so, any other questions? Was was Merlin supposed to be a druid? No, he was. Um, there were druids at the time, and in, when you if you read Myths of Babylon, they talk about the druids. Merlin was born. Oh, I just love old age. Memory just fails me. Um, he was born of a demon and a regular woman, a sorcerer, or some kind of badly influenced being. <laughs> and that's why he had all these powers. Uh, but supposedly, if you see him sometimes in pictures, he's reading these volumes uh, where he's getting all his sorcery tricks from, uh, which is completely, like you said, they, they, didn't have, they didn't write anything down if you set him in the fifth century. But um, when I left that class, I asked my professor, um, and we all asked the professor because we all had to do research. Uh, I did mine on hermits because they kept popping up like flies throughout the... Mallory's rendition. Um, oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you, the, the end where Guinevere becomes a nun, Bors, oh no, Bedivere goes to Glastonbury Abbey where he becomes a monk. Eventually, Lancelot shows up in Glastonbury and for seven years he is a monk. Um, Guinevere has asked him not to ever come and see her again. But when she dies, he stops eating, he stops drinking, um, and he wastes away and dies. Um, so they all become monks and nuns. 